us than silver or gold. I'd rather have hips than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. Yes, I'd rather be led by his little pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or oh, be held in sin's red sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than world wide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name. Domain and be held in sin the way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything in the world of today. And didn't we read that today? Silver and gold have a none, but such as these I give unto you. Rise up and walk. From a rare He is sweeter than honey from out of the comb. He is all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead. Domain and be held in dreadful swift way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus. Anything this world affords today. Would, yes, wouldn't we? Rather have Jesus. And today we're uh, in week number 18, Judgment. So we're making progress at Exploring God's Library. So welcome, welcome to uh, Exploring God's Library. Um, on Facebook Live, and we're happy that you're here. Um, I hope you're you're uh, making it making it through this uh, this area because this is a uh, this is an area where we're dealing with chronicles, we're dealing with a lot of genealogies, etc. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that a little bit today. And um, uh, if you're new, you're more than welcome to join us uh, this winter as we read through li uh, God's library as revealed in His library of 66 books written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The description of Bible uh, reading is designed to uh, uh, designed and to complement your study of the Bible. It's a necessary component, component of your daily walk with God, along with fellowship at a local church. This is how the Bible reading program works out. It only takes 20 minutes a day of, if you just read straight through the select passages. The scriptures, also known as the Law and the Prophets, are com composed of 39 books, widely known as the Old Testament. The first five books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, the Law, or in Greek, the Pentateuch, the five scrolls. Each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a Parsha. 
And in one year, we systematically read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The, this religious reading uh, custom uh, dates back to the 6th century B.C., and it was established during the 70-year exile of the Jewish community known as the Babylonian captivity. To this day, everyone reads from the same chapters, which make it easier to discuss the word uh, on a daily basis. And then we'll systematically, uh, sequentially read through an assigned portion from the <clears throat> historic books and major and minor prophets. Additionally, we will read from the wisdom literature, the Psalm of the Day, the same seven Psalms on a weekly basis, and then one of the 150 Psalms. In that way, we cover all 150 Psalms twice in a year. Then we'll read one or two Proverbs, intentionally slowing down the pace so we, we might meditate on that passage during the day, applying the biblical idea of line upon line, precept upon precept. It's not, it's not Eastern meditation, it's biblical meditation. Finally, each day we will read a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, you can read more if you'd like. It's no problem. But this, is, uh, this, this um, <clears throat> reading calendar will help you get through the entire Bible in a year. And then every Tuesday evening, like tonight, we'll re review some of our readings. We're not going to read them all, but we're going to provide commentary from, drawn from uh, various suggested resources. And if you're not able to make it, at that time, we'll post a link on exploringgodslibrary.org. Uh, and also, uh, we'll post a link on, um, on Exploring God's Library private Facebook page. <clears throat> it said that the Westminster Shorter Catechism, that man's, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The Word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what God requires of man. We're going to read, uh, I read, read this this week, it was very helpful to me, um, from the Valley Vision, it's talking about morning needs. And so bow with me. It's not morning, but it's, it's still good. O oh God, the author of all good, we come to you for the grace of another day for will require for its duties and events. We step out into a wicked world we carry about within, within us an evil heart. I know that without you we can do nothing, that everything with, you, with which I shall be concerned, however harmless in itself, may prove an occasion of sin or folly. Unless I am kept by your, your power, hold me up and, and I shall be safe. Preserve my understanding from subtlety of error, my affections from love of idols, my character from stain of vice, my profession from every form of evil. May I engage in nothing in which I cannot implore your inspection. Prosper me, prosper me in all lawful undertakings or prepare me for disappointments. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me unless I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or be poor and steal and take your name in vain. May every creature be made good to me by prayer and your will. Teach me how to use the world and not abuse it to improve my talents, to redeem my time, to walk in wisdom towards those without and in kindness to those within, to do good to all men, especially to my fellow Christians, and to you be the glory. And Lord, we pray for those that are suffering. Oh, there's a lot of suffering going on in the world. Um, oh, yeah, I can't even just mention some of them, when, but... Um, just some of the suffering that's going on with some uh, fellow sisters is just horrific. And, uh, and then we think about all those that are still in captivity in, in Israel as hostages, just wicked, wicked things they're doing to them and have done to them. And we pray for your, your freedom for them, Lord. Even afterwards, it's going to be very rough for them, gone through such terrible torture. And Lord, we pray for those that are just suffering in the world, in, in every nation. We sure need you, Lord. We need the Lord. We need your return. There's not much. It's like we seem to really have blown it as a people. And uh, we need your, your, your presence. And we need your, your, um, your intercession on behalf of all of us as we walk through this dark world. 
And tonight, Lord, we pray that uh, you would make sense of the things that I'm going to go over. Um, and bless the people, bless the readers that are on tonight. Bless those that are consistent and and give them consistency and help them read through the scriptures. We love you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Open our ears and our eyes and our heart and our mind to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in the covenant community. In Jesus' name, amen. As we turn our attention to this week's Torah portion, a question is, is asked, why do we need the Old Testament? And it's kind of surprising, a question like that, isn't it? But, uh, you know, the, the you know, more and more we look at that, we recognize that people don't know the Bible. Even believers don't know the whole Bible. You know, they look at New Testament maybe, or they uh, pick and choose different things. And we're, tight, we're cold, told quite clearly in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6 or 13, that all the things which happened in the Old Testament became our examples and happened to them as examples and were written for our <coughs> admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Walter Kaiser, the famous Old Testament scholar, said the most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament is to be used and what roles it must play in the life of believers is to be found in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 in Paul's admonition to his young disciple, Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Since Paul had just finished referring to the sacred writings, it is clear that he has the Old Testament writings in mind. Paul urges the church to go to the Old Testament to get her doctrine and her teaching material. Because the, the Bible teaches itself. I mean, Scripture enforces uh, and will, will underscore what New Testament says and Old Testament says. When the Apostle Paul arrived in Berea and taught in the synagogues, the Bereans were far more fair-minded than the, those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And that was in Acts 17, 11. Remember, the New Testament canon was not yet complete at that time, and so the Bereans diligently searched the scriptures to see if what the Apostle Paul was taught was according to the scriptures. And that's how we should be. We should use the standard of the scripture to measure what others may teach us. We don't put our minds on hold as believers, but are called to love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. At the same time, Paul in Timothy 2.2 said that the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And in 1 Corinthians 11.1-2, 1 imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep their traditions just as I deliver them to you. Follow tr the tradition of the apostles and the apostles' doctrine. Today we have the entire corpus or body of scriptures, and so we hold dearly to them. We're looking at Exodus, <coughs> chapters 21 through 24 this week, and we're, um, we're using uh, John J. Davis's uh, commentary on Moses and the gods of Egypt. Davis comments about ancient codes which precede the law of Moses, and that while we should expect some parallels between these laws uh, and those with, um, which appear in the Bible, far too often, however, the resemblance between the biblical and ancient Near Eastern laws have been greatly exaggerated, even to the point of attempting, attempting to show generic relationships. As far as the Bible is concerned, it's quite clearly stated that the law code contained in the book of Exodus came by revolution, uh, revelation of God. That's at Mount Sinai, right? It was not produced by a copious method via the hand of Moses. It is often argued that the source of Moses' legal material was the Code of Hammurabi. Now, I, I posted something on uh, Exploring God's Library, a private Facebook page, uh, about, uh, it's, it's from a teacher who teaches uh, history to kids, and it's pretty good. Um, and it gives you a kind of a picture of, um, you know, the geography, et cetera. So I think it's worth uh, seeing. And, uh, but this theory, however, has been adequately disproved by a number of writers. It has been pointed out that in biblical law, the divine origin is stressed everywhere giving the particular injunctions their authority. That's, where do you get authority? Well, it has to be from 
you know, from God. In other Oriental codes, religion or theology plays only a subordinate and insignificant part. It was not it was the king, not the god, who gave his authority to a particular code. And you remember when we were reading about uh, <coughs> Pharaoh, Pharaoh gave a lot of authority to, to the laws because he was the god king. And this whole idea of god king has is, is, been going, going on since Nimrod. And then um, uh, you'll see that even in, in Tibetan Buddhism, you, know, you have the Dalai Lama as a god king. So what he says goes. Or the Pope, he he's supposedly uh, speaks ex cathedra from you know the the from God's God's seat. But then, is he saying is what he's saying according to God's law? No. Uh, he's he's uh, he's saying now that uh, that we're to bless uh, the the Catholics are to bless. Um, uh, homosexual marriage, which is an anathema unto God, it's it's not uh, it's not part of Scripture. Now, as a, after a very careful study of the relationships of the law of Hammurabi and the laws found in the Book of Exodus, M. David concludes: To my mind, there is even no indication whatsoever that a biblical legislator has known the code of Hammurabi and has been influenced by it in any way. So it wasn't like, oh, okay, we just borrowed that and you know we put it down on paper. No, God's word is inspired by God. It's God, God breathed. And uh, G.T. Manley, who was a, um, a theologian from the UK in the 1800s, uh, has also cited a number of significant differences between the biblical law and the Babylonian law. A great deal of material found in the Code of Hammurabi is oriented economically and culturally in such a way as to provide no parallels whatsoever with the Old Testament material. In Exodus 20, uh, chapter 21, it has the law concerning servants, the law concerning violence. So there are a lot of things, animal control laws, if you're you know, gored by an ox, etc. Um, and while slavery was a common phenomenon in all countries of the ancient, ancient world, uh, and they differed from one land to another, in some lands, Babylonia, the demand for slaves was greater than in others. As far as the Israelite law was concerned, it was unique because God was a source of law, and those laws were based on un unchanging moral and ethical norms, whereas other law systems were produced out of social and economic necessities. In other words, it changed all the time. But God says, <clears throat> you, if, you, if, you, um, if you strike your servant, you're going to let him free. You're going to hurt him, you're going to strike his teeth, you're going you're gonna to let him free. Um, the treatment of the slave in the Old Testament finds no real parallel among other nations of the ancient Near East. Exodus uh, chapter 22, responsibility for property. You see a lot of that. Um, you see the moral and ceremonial principles. And then you look at uh, the law of the Sabbath, the annual feast that they had to go up to every year. Um, feasts are not, no longer required, but they, but they were practiced by the Jewish community. But uh, now you ha don't have a temple to go to. Um, then in Exodus chapter 24, Israel affirms the covenant on the mountain with God. The material in Exodus that we are about to consider is commonly referred to as the Book of the Covenant, based on the expression found in 24.7. The Book of the Covenant is considered to, at 2022 20, to conclude with chapter 23. These chapters contain a detailed en enlargement of the principles uh, contained in the Decalogue, that's the Ten Commandments, and are composed of various civil, social, and religious uh, issues contained in the Decalogue and are composed of various civil um, and social and religious laws. Now, a lot of this has changed because of ceremonies. They don't do ceremonies any longer. There's no temple to do the ceremonies there. Okay, um, we're looking at Chronicles as well, and I want to read something on Chronicles. Um, which is quite interesting. Uh, I'm using um, I'm using the NIV application commentary by Andrew E. Uh, e. Hill, which is very helpful. And um, let me get my glass so I can read this. And I know a lot of you have been reading the Bible for a long time, but um, 
or maybe you haven't, um, retelling the story, the Chronicler's genealogical prologue (coughs) fails as a literary device today because the story of the Old Testament has no currency in our post-Christian or post-biblical society. Beyond this, the genealogical prologue provides extraneous because any story told with names only is incomprehensible in a postmodern culture. Now, it wasn't that it wasn't that way in in Babylon because these were this is written in, in Babylon, okay? Um, and Ezra was quoting these things, so a lot of people knew the names. You, you just you would say a name and it would trigger something about you because you have grown up with David or or these different prophets, or different kings. Um, <clears throat> the fragmentation and trivializa- trivialization of knowledge, the individual individualization of learning, and the tribalization of human experience in postmodern culture denies universal relevance to any story, let alone a story told through the seemingly endless register of names in a genealogy. Sadly, the shadow of post-modernity grows steadily longer and darker over the Christian subculture. As one prominent biblical scholar has noted, the Bible has become a springboard for personal piety and meditation, not a book to be read. Isn't that strange? It's, it's a strange, but it's, it's true. Do we read it, you know, or we just pick and choose something? According to the unscientific results of biblical literacy tests given to Christian young people over the past several years, there is an emerging trend of an alarming lack of basic Bible knowledge. Um, Though many youth and adults in the church use the Bible on a regular basis, few seem to know its stories. And that's why we're trying to start to introduce people to the stories that you run into. We've, um, uh, if you're going to pronunciation, trying to learn how to pronounce these these, uh, terms, we're looking at Alexander Scorby, um, and we have in the past uh, uh, but Scor- uh, links to Scorby's uh, a reading, so you can just read after, you know, with, along with your own Bible. So let's talk. Usually one bogs down in the genealogies, and yet it's through reading genealogies, through though tedious at times, which yields precious treasures, like peeling or a pomegranate or a sweet orange, or mining for diamond and gold, diamonds and gold. The word of God will not return void without accomplishing its purpose. All scripture that, that is, all scripture is profitable for reproof, correction, and training up in righteousness. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it is the glory of kings to search out a matter. So what you're doing in scripture is you personally are responsible to search out the matter. You want something, you have to dig for it. It's not a, just a, you know, a walk in the park sometimes. The Gadites, whose one man was worth a hundred, the greatest worth a thousand, men who would swim across the swollen Jordan River in spring, honorable men, the children of Benjamin and Judah, the mighty captains of Manasseh, men who came with a perfect heart to serve David, and the tribes, the children of Issachar, gifted astronomers, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. That's from a commentary. Um, So... I hope you had a chance to um, listen to H.B. Uh, Charles on, on, on the prayer of Jabez. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. You're going to come into things and you're going to go, wow. And you're just reading all these people. You have no idea who they are. But once you get to know them, it's marvelous. And, um, and you know, take advantage. We're, we're in the Internet. The days of the Internet, you can find things. If you find something that I haven't, you know, I'm, not posting, please post it. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's a hard work for all of us. Um, and if you notice, there's a lot of uh, things about gatekeepers and, you know, um, David's army. And uh, you'll have, you'll have, um, you'll notice that uh, um, Uriah is mentioned as one of the mighty men. It doesn't even talk about Bathsheba. Because, see, everybody knew about this scandal. It's like the reading the, uh, reading the Variety magazine or something, or, or Hollywood Reporter. I mean, people knew, knew about that scandal big time. But Chronicles was not written. <coughs> Chronicles was written to encourage us and encourage the people that are in exile. Very, very important. 
And then Chronicles 14, David established at Jerusalem and the Philistines defeated. And then the ark was brought up to Jerusalem. And I, I don't know if you recall, there was a, we had a special video that uh, actually showed, uh, gave an aerial view of what happened historically over the, how Jerusalem grew and then how, how the tent, a place was placed for the tent for the ark in Jerusalem. Um, and the ark is placed in the tabernacle, you know, and so, so you're reading a lot of amazing, you know, amazing stories here. And then you, um, okay, then you get into the census that uh, Israel took and how it brought curses on David. Um, New Testament. Let's look at the New Testament a little bit. Um, first of all, I'm going to look at the, the whole idea of the apostles and using, um, using um, R.C. Sproul's uh, um, Reformation Study Bible because he'll, he'll actually put in uh, certain things that are very important as they appear in Scripture, like doctrines, etc. So I like what he wrote on the apostles. So let me uh, read it to you. Since 12 of those who were with the disciples of Christ later became his apostles, the two terms, disciple and apostle, are often confused. Although the terms are often interchangeable, they are not exact synonyms. A disciple is defined in the Bible as a learner, one who entered into the fellowship of Jesus' rabbinic instruction. Um, though the apostles were disciples, not all the disciples became apostles. An apostle enjoyed a special office in the New Testament church. The term apostle means one who is sent. Technically, however, an apostle was more than a messenger. He was, he was commissioned with the authority to speak for and represent the one who sent him. The chief apostle in the New Testament is Jesus himself. He was sent by the Father and spoke with the authority invested in him by the Father. To reject Jesus was to reject the Father who sent him. Likewise, the apostles were called and commissioned directly by Christ and spoke with his authority. To reject apostolic authority was to reject the authority of Christ um, who sent them. I remember uh, talking to, um, going to, to a, uh, to a Presbyterian church that was uh, that was hosting a blood relic tour of Buddhist idols and 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 blood crystals from from uh, cremations etc. in Santa Monica. It was awful, and um, <clears throat> I felt the Lord um, you know, saying, "Go down there and confront them." So I did, and uh, um, it, and it was on a Monday, and I got down there and talked to the 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 later he. The, the woman who was the receptionist, she said, oh, he doesn't come in on Monday. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, well, I was really concerned about the fact that you used your fellowship hall to host this blood relic tour. I mean, this is happening today. This is in reality. This is not in the you know, first century, second century. This is, you know, this is today. And so um, uh, she said, oh, he's, he, just, he just showed up. That's interesting. So the pastor, she went and talked to the pastor, and the pastor came over to me, and, um, and he said, what do, you, what do you want? I said, I'm really concerned that you're, you open your, your church to these blood relics, these idols. And he said, he, he asked me a question, by what authority are you here? By what authority? He was questioning authority. And I'm not an apostle, but I am, I am one that is a gatekeeper. Gatekeeper, I see these things. And the Lord obviously is using me to do this. And, uh, um, and he, he said uh, that he went to Fuller Theological Seminary. I said, so I, went, I got my master's there too. And uh, so he's challenging me. And I said, I'm here because of you're, you're going against you know, God's word. You're, you're bringing idols into your house. If you, you can't bring idols in your house and not be burned. And so, um, so it's very important that we understand that, um, you know, that people are sent, but the big apostle, 
the big A apostle, or we're talking about the 12 apostles. And actually there was uh, 13 because Judas was, Judas betrayed uh, Christ. And, uh, and then his office was taken by another. And that's a fulfillment of scripture, by the way. And so um, Matthias, uh, Mattathias uh, uh, f- um, took over his office. So um, continuing, it says, well, that was in um, 12 disciples who were commissioned as apostles. Um, let me get up here better so you can see. Um, and after Judas' death, the church replaced the vacancy uh, by selecting Matthias as, as re- Acts or records. And to this number, Jesus um, added the Apostle Paul as a special apostle to the Gentiles. Paul's apostleship was a matter of s- some debate because he did not meet all of the requirements for an apostle yet set forth in Acts. The cri- criteria for uh, apostleship included being a disciple of Jesus during his earthly ministry, an eyewitness of the resurrection, and called and (coughs) commissioned directly by Christ. Paul was not a former disciple, and his vision of the resurrected Christ occurred after Jesus' ascension. Paul was not an... Paul was not a... Paul was not a former disciple, and his vision of the resurrected Christ occurred after Jesus' ascension. Paul was not an eyewitness of the resurrection in the same way the other apostles were. None, nevertheless, Paul was directly called to the office by Christ. His call was confirmed by other apostles whose apostleship was not in doubt and was an authenticated by the miracles God performed through him, attesting the authority as an apostle, an apostolic agent of revelation. By the late uh, first century, the post-apostolic fathers clearly recognized that their authority was subordinate to the original apostles. There was no official apostles alive today, as no one can meet the biblical criteria for the office or be confirmed by the original apostles as Paul was. The Bible is the only apostolic authority for us today. Interesting. Gives you a picture of that. Well, in Acts also is very interesting in the sense that... <clears throat> Oh, do you have? Oh, here it is. I'm looking at the MacArthur New Testament commentary on Acts, and uh, just a little bit, a couple of statements here about um, you know about Acts. Luke states his purpose for writing the two-volume work and the prologue to Luke. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out. Write it out for your uh, consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus. Acts was also addressed to Theophilus, containing, continuing where Luke's gospel left off. It's really, this is the first, uh, first book on church history. So it's very, quite, quite interesting. So, you know, in Luke, you've heard about, we talked about Luke and how he was a physician and, and he, was, he was perfectly, um, uh, he, was, he was gifted in, in medicine. And so he was able to uh, look at the miracles and say, oh, that hand was withered and it was from such and such a disease. So um, Theophilus is unknown through, uh, though Luke's address of him as most excellent suggests he was a Roman official. Whether he was a Christian, Luke was instructing, or a pagan, he was trying to persuade is also not known. Some have argued that he was Paul's lawyer for his hearing before the emperor, uh, though that also is uh, speculation. Luke did not complete, did not write a complete account of the first three decades of the church. He selectively chose those events and persons that suited his inspired purposes. Nevertheless, he was a remarkable, accurate, remarkably accurate historian. Acts shows familiarity with the Roman law and the privileges of Roman citizens, gives the correct titles of various provincial rulers, and accurately describes various geographical locations. And it was so accurate that Sir William Ramsey, um, he was a 19th century British archaeologist, he could use the Bible, and it was accurate to you know, the, the places he went to. And he said, I may fairly claim to have entered into this investigation without any prejudice or favor of the conclusion which I shall now 
attempt to justify to the reader. On the contrary, I began with a mind unfavorable, unfavorable to it. For the ingenuity and apparent completeness of the Tubigen theory, which dated Acts in the second century, had at one time quite convinced me. It did not lie then in my line of life to investigate the subject minutely, but more recently I found myself often brought in contact with the Book of Acts as an authority for the topography, antiquities, and society of Asia. It was gradually borne in me, upon me, that in various details the narratives showed marvelous truth. And if you look at uh, Ron Wyatt, um, who's looking at the Ark and, uh, and other archaeologists, they found that the biblical record was the thing that really guided them to the truth. And, um, and the, the accuracy of where these things actually were. So, so the Word of God is very, very powerful. Um, okay, so... Um, there is a... Uh, uh, we did post a playlist of sermons on the book of Acts by John MacArthur, right? Is a playlist? Yes. And so uh, that you can get on the uh, Exploring God's Library Facebook page. It's very helpful. Uh, 30, 31? 31 uh, sermons. 31 sermons. And um, we actually did this to give you um, an example of what expository preaching is. Um, you know, line by line, verse by verse. And um, <coughs> it's uh, quite amazing. How many sermons were there? Uh, 31 for Acts. Oh, 31 for, for Acts that we posted, but there are many more that are on there. Um, but you can get that on uh, gracetoyou.org. Uh, it's very helpful, especially if you're, you know, you want to do a, a comprehensive study of the Book of Acts. And the Book of Acts is really the the Book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. This is the first, you know, first. You look at the the prologue. The Holy Spirit is promised, and remember, um, Jesus when he was saying, uh, when he's talking to them in the um, the upper room, uh, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And they were really upset because they had been with him all those days and, and um, you know, three years. They had seen him, you know, do miracles of all sorts. And so they're very, very, um, they're longing just to be with him. And he says, but it, it's better that I go away because then I will send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us and abides in us in our temple. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's no longer a physical temple, you know, like the um, in 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 Jerusalem. There, there's a we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit abides in us, so he's he's moved into us, and um, and so um, so he's the one that's our teacher now, and uh, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the, of the Father in heaven, and in chapter two. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the crowd's response. Remember, they're all speaking in tongues and different languages. Pretty, pretty amazing. And I think uh, we have also a video uh, on uh, Babel, Tower of Babel mm -hmm. about the confusion of the languages and, and that, that can help you. And, um, and the person, we're, the person I, I picked this week to talk about is Daniel Gogerly. And uh, I want to just talk about Daniel Gogoli because I, one of the things we're attempting to do is talk about some of the church's history now and people that are working. Uh, and, um, and I have, um, um, I have something on Gogoli, so I'm going to read, read something that I, I used to have it on, posted on our, our, our website, but uh, that's no longer available. Uh, Daniel John Gogerly was a British Wesleyan Methodist missionary and scholar who served in uh, Sri Lanka, Ceylon, and provided one of the first translations of the Pali text into English. He studied the Pali text for 14 years as a missionary. Now, to be a, truly be a missionary, you're going to be learning um, two languages, according to one of my um, missionary friends that works among Tibetans. He said, you're going to work, learn a trade language and you also learn the language you're going to. And Daniel Gogoli was, was no exception. He, he studied polytext for 14 years. And so he, was, he delivered something called Christiani Prapatni. This is a book that uh, was hard to find. Um, and, uh, and this 
uh, actually caused a, a, a revolution in, in uh, Sri Lanka because he was reading the Buddhist text in the original language. He knew more about the, the Buddhist text than the Buddhists themselves, the priest. And so um, uh, he, um, he served in, in Sri Lanka from 18, uh, 1818 and he never returned to England. He studied, uh, he wrote the apologetic that many Buddhists could not refute. They couldn't refute it. And many modern Christians that are in ecumenical, um, into the ecumenical movement blast him for his work. Um, and personally, I love what I read. Um, the Buddhists destroyed, destroyed copies. They were, there was no printing presses until he was there um, because they started printing these apologetic materials and it just turned that turned the Buddhists upside down. I mean, for example, um, they were talking about um, the the Buddhist one of the Buddhist lead the Buddha's lead disciples after um, was asked, um, "Did you know that such and so and so died?" And he didn't know that his disciple died. And but they were always always saying the Buddha is omniscient; he knows everything. But that's not true. And uh, he would, um, um, they would go through and you know look at these different passages about, you know, make, it was almost like making a Buddha a god, and he's not. And the Buddhists destroyed many of these um, publications, and they had these these big debates, and there's lots of writing about that. Anyway, that was um, so one of the, the the missionaries that was a, a linguist that. Um, did some very hard work in, in Sri Lanka, uh, Old Day Salon. Okay, um, let's see. The memory verse this week is from Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And the prophecy to reign on David's throne forever is in uh, First Chronicles, 17, 12 to 13 in the New Testament in Luke 1, 32 through 30, 33. And of course, we sang the hymn in the beginning, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. It's a very interesting hymn. Um, uh, it's very, very encouraging. Although it's uh, in American hymnals, shows that Re, um, Re Muller, as the author of the song, Swedish sources attribute the original to Prince Oscar Bernadette. In 1888, he relinquished his royal title and right to succession in order to marry a commoner who had influenced his religious beliefs. Afterwards, he was active in Christian service. I mean, it's really a love song, and it's really great. Um, I want to talk just about some of the YouTube posts uh, that I'd recommend you look at. Um, there is the... The one uh, gentleman who's talking about, let me just see if I can pull it up. Um, there's um, okay, there is I have to make sure it's up there. Can you, Elizabeth, make sure that I got that one post on Hammurabi? Hammurabi? Yeah, and I, I posted it, but it doesn't seem to have come up. Maybe it's there now. Um, let me see if I can go refresh my screen. There's also um, a gentleman I, I came across, which I found quite helpful. It's... Um, Well, you just have to uh, screen, uh, go through it. It's a, uh, I can't see it right now. I'm sorry, um, but there's a lot of, a lot of material there that I mean, it's not expected you watch all these, but it doesn't hurt. Um, there's a guy that I just discovered. His name is R. L.
Oh, I can't see it. Well, anyway, that's that's okay. Well, um, that's about it. I hope your your reading is going well. Um, and you, the main thing is just be consistent, and um, uh, you know, comment when you see these these uh, different posts. I you know, I I found some interesting interviews that uh, you might you might uh, find helpful. Uh, one was about uh, uh, John MacArthur about how he prepares his sermons. It was a very good interview. Um, not that all of you are interested in preparing sermons, but um, but you start to see what goes into these uh, sermons and uh, who the man is, and I think that is helpful. And also, you see, uh, there's a I saw something a, a relationship between uh, MacArthur and and R.C. Sproul, and it's quite a friendship and quite touching at the end. And um, you, know, you see a lot of humor, and uh, sometimes it's uh, it's encouraging to see that you know not everything is all you know th- you know they they have a good sense of humor. Um, and there there's a demonstration by um, R.C. and and uh, Steve Lawson about uh, about you know um, between our the difference between our sanctification and our glorification. And it's very, very good. So anyway, these are things that, you know, just things that we're introducing to you along the way. And I hope you're enjoying your reading. I hope you're profiting from it. And, um, and continue, to, continue to work through these, these um, you know, these, you know, through chronicles. And, and search for those treasures. Search for the treasures. I think you'll be blessed. All right. Well, may the Lord bless you this week and um, in your reading. Continue to read and remember um, uh, that it's a, it's a necessary appointment we have every day with the Lord, and it's a precious appointment being with Him. Blessings on all of you, and God bless. Bye.